Welcome back, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed a very scary conference. Now we're going to hear from Dan. But before, I'd like to thank the organizers, and that's Container Solutions, and our sponsors. And they are Container Solutions, Equinix, Cycloid, Giant Swarm, Instana, and Kinvoke. Now, Dan Finneran, he's a Developer Relations Engineering Manager at Packet, and he's, he's going to tell us very scary stories, not about monsters, not about spirits, not about ghosts, but about humans. Take it away, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, it is very warm in this mask, but uh, hopefully we'll make it through. Uh, so today's talk is really um, about my experiences over the last kind of 15 or so years. Um, hence the title, it, it wasn't a ghost in the machine, it was me behind the keyboard. Uh, I'm going to be touching on kind of a variety of technologies um, and a variety of experiences I've had where uh, mistakes have <laughs> accidentally taken down systems and, and caused uh, outages and things like that. Um, so before we begin, uh, I really just want to take a kind of a quick moment to kind of say, you know, mistakes happen all the time. Uh, people are always making mistakes. It's easy to kind of mistype numbers, make spelling mistakes and, and balance multiple things in their head. Um, but that should never really stop you from wanting to try and experiment, try new things and to try and learn. So you know, kind of regardless of seniority or job title or things such as that, um, you know, the IT industry is forever evolving. Uh, there's a lot of things kind of happening. Um, and, you know, just given that, everybody is going to be a beginner at some point or another. So, uh, you know, you should go out there, you should learn, play and experiment. Try not to do it on production systems, um, but worst case scenario, uh, you'll be able to make a presentation about your experiences afterwards. Um, so I've kind of done this in the uh, true Simpsons Treehouse of Terror uh, kind of format. Um, so to kick things off, um, the first section is going to be uh, basically uh, Raiders of the Lost Art. So this really is uh, the tale of my first server. Um, I, I purchased this server um, from eBay um, in 2005, a long time ago. Back when uh, <laughs> I looked like this, back when my hair was like this, um, uh, I ordered this server on eBay without really knowing anything about kind of rack mount servers. So this large thing kind of turned up at my door. Um, it had two blazing fast Pentium 3 processors. It had a RAID controller, which I didn't really know too much about at the time, and a pair of massive 20 uh, gigabyte disks. Um, and it also had a collection of the loudest fans that I'd ever come across. Um, I, again, as I was saying, I didn't really know too much about enterprise hardware at the time. Uh, I was a student at this point uh, in shared accommodation. Um, and this thing was so loud that we really kind of struggled to find anywhere in the house that we could kind of have this thing running without it keeping all of us awake at night. Um, but, you know, kind of back to the raid point, uh, I didn't really know too much about it before I kind of set the system up the first time. Uh, so I kind of did a bit of research around RAID, which um, or RAID controllers, um, you know, and the kind of two versions of RAID that I was mainly looking at or had the option to use was either RAID 1, which is mirrored, which essentially is where uh, an identical copy of everything is written to both disks. So in the event that uh, one of the disks will fail, um, there's no kind of data loss. And the other one is RAID 0, which is uh, referred to as striped. Uh, and this is where data is written across both of them. Uh, and me, in my naive naivety, uh, really just kind of saw fast and maximum. So, uh, you know, this is the fastest way you're going to be able to read uh, and write data, and you're also going to get maximum usage of the disks themselves. Uh, in the event that a disk dies, then you've pretty much lost everything. Um, so why does any of this really matter? Well, I set this server up. Uh, it'd been up and running for a while. Um, and one of my uh, old roommates who'd moved out decided to go kind of on a, a world tour, um, traveling all around Southeast Asia and the US and a bunch of other places. Uh, and he uh, he set up, uh, well, I, I basically set up for him a gallery for him to use. Um, and over the course of over a year and a half, he basically had been uploading all of these photographs so that you know, members of his family could see them, see what he was doing and where he was and things like that. Uh, Unfortunately, one day I got a, uh, an MSN message, uh, if we can remember those, basically saying he couldn't access any of his photographs. Um, and the inevitable had actually happened when I checked the server itself. So uh, I, I kind of rang him up uh, and told him that, you know, 
half the half the storage had died. Uh, I didn't explain it very well because he wondered whether he'd lost uh, the first half of his trip's photographs or the second half of his trip's photographs. Uh, unfortunately, it was all of his photographs um, that had all been lost due to the data outage. Um, I obviously felt quite quite bad about the whole thing. I didn't find out uh, until quite a while afterwards that he actually had a backup copy of all of his photographs on his laptop. Um, so luckily, I kind of uh, didn't ruin that too much, but uh, it was certainly a lesson uh, in terms of uh, architecture design um, when building out infrastructure. Uh, the next story is uh, what's eating Gilbert Grepp. Um, at this point, I was actually working as a Unix administrator. Um, we were doing night shifts, so it was daytime and nighttime, so 12 hour shifts, very long, and very tiring. Most of the day was kind of spent looking at these sorts of things. So this is essentially the, the UI that we had, which would detail um, what's actually taking place within the infrastructure. We'd basically get alerts to go and look at things. And the usual kind of uh, thing that we would come across would be um, things like uh, disks that were filling up and we needed to do something about them. So this essentially is the output from a, a Solaris system from uh, back in the day. Uh, and if we look at the bottom here, we can see that the, uh, this mount point here is very full. Uh, the procedure that we were always told to use uh, that was handed down to us when we started there really was that we would find logs that were on these mount points. We would push them, uh, we would pipe them through a compressed program on Solaris 8 and then write the output um, to one of the file systems that had space, at which point we could delete the logs and move the archives in their place. However, uh, the person that was doing this bit of work that night um, rather tiredly kind of copied and pasted the wrong mount point name and instead copied and pasted the actual device path. Um, so when he basically um, cat all of this data into the compress tool, he then rewrote all of the output straight to the physical disk itself. So he wiped out the, uh, the underlying file system, uh, which was a bit of a mistake, but at, you know, working 12 hour shifts, these sorts of things happen. Uh, we spent a lot of our time actually working with these big uh, Solaris systems, these big sun systems. We were always kind of very excited when we got the opportunity to work on one of these E10Ks. Um, these things were massive. They're as big as fridges. Um, I, and I can't remember the exact reason why, but one of my colleagues um, was tasked with finding out um, on one of these servers with massive uptime, when was the last time it had been rebooted? So he logged on uh, and looked at the log file. So this is where the log files typically would be in Solaris 8. And his plan was to basically look through the messages file and find out when it was rebooted last. Uh, I'll let you look at that for a second to try and work out what he did wrong. Yeah, he actually forgot to put grep in there. Um, so what he actually did was basically pass a load of data into the reboot um, command that generally ignored anything from standard in and just rebooted the server there and then. Uh, and as I mentioned, these E10 case, they were generally used for kind of business critical stuff. Um, but again, you know, working in the middle of the night uh, <laughs> after doing a 12 hour shift and things like that, uh, it was very easy to kind of make those mistakes. Uh, the next movie uh, is Failover to Launch. So uh, a little bit later in my career, um, working on much large systems. Um, well, not much large systems, much more important systems. In this case, uh, looking uh, at, at high availability systems um, where we would basically kind of perform maintenance on them. This is I'm just trying to quickly step through what the architecture of these, these systems would typically look like. Um, you typically need to buy at least two of these very expensive um, machines in order for um, some level of high availability. Access was typically through, uh, you know, kind of top of rack switch. Um, both of them would speak to one another through a cluster interconnect so that if the event of the storage or the networking being down, um, they could still speak to each other to determine which was the primary. Uh, and then finally shared storage. So uh, regardless of which one was the primary, they had access to the underlying data. So this, you know, kind of looks similar to some of the ways that we run applications today. Um, Things don't change all that much sometimes in IT. Uh, we get a lot of repetition, I suppose. Um, but this is kind of what it would actually look like from actually running and starting the application. Uh, typically, we would have an application group, and that contained all of the components of the full application itself. 
Um, and the one that I remember the most was basically quite a simplistic one, but it was uh, Oracle database with a number of mount points. Uh, the main Java application, which would also have a mount point for its logs. Uh, and then once all of these two, once these additional components were actually started, uh, it would then uh, start the virtual IP address. So um, that is essentially how we knew the application was up and running, and that was the architecture of that. So this is kind of the situation. Um, the primary node, one of these large Solaris servers, um, we started to detect that there was a number of hardware issues um, that were being reported. Um, and given that the application was of such importance, we were given um, a change window in order to move that application over. Uh, and we were asked to move the, uh, the components of the application over uh, one by one to ensure that we knew that everything had kind of gone successfully. So the, the change window started. Uh, the first thing we did was disable the, the virtual IP address so nobody could access the, um, the running application at that point. The next step was to take down the database. So uh, the database was stopped, the mount points were unmounted, and then we restarted that database over on the secondary node. So as per the kind of instructions that we were given by like the application owners uh, and the ops team for this particular application, uh, we were then told to kind of watch the logs of the application whilst it kind of uh, finished working on any of its cached connections. Uh, and we were also um, watching the logs of the database to make sure um, that these things, that the database was coming up as expected. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you, you spotted what the issue may be yet, but um, at this point we thought everything was going well. The database had all come up successfully on the other node. Um, and the next step really was to start moving the application over. Uh, this is where things started to go wrong. Um, we triggered as part of the cluster control, the shutdown of the application and the move over to the secondary system, at which point the application uh, shut down. Um, uh, then we started to see a number of strange errors. The database was tried to be failed back. That didn't work either at which point the application kept stopping and starting, the database kept stopping and starting, um, and we couldn't work out what was going on. So the major incidents team were involved. Uh, we had the operations teams, the developers all logging on, trying to work out what the actual problem was. Now, you may have seen these two errors before, the top one you would see on Solaris, the bottom one you would see on Linux. Um, but typically, if you are, or if a process is running on a mounted path, then you will be unable to mount it. Uh, unfortunately, it took us quite a while to work out that this was probably the case that we were actually hitting. So about one hour later, with involvement from the major incident team, with involvement from uh, all of the operations and the development teams all getting involved, uh, we suddenly kind of worked out what the actual problem was. Uh, the problem was that essentially everybody had jumped onto these systems to sit and watch the logs. And whilst we were actually on those file systems watching the logs, the cluster manager could no longer unmount those partitions. So as part of due diligence, we'd actually kind of denial of service ourselves in terms of being able to fail over the application itself. So for the entire change window, we spent most of our time chasing our own tails uh, and essentially kind of getting ourselves into a position where we couldn't get the application to move over. So once we'd actually realized what the actual issue was, we kicked everybody uh, off that server, at which point it could uh, unmount its log, uh, log mount stop the application and start to move things over as expected. So finally, uh, after kind of working out something that should have seemed so obvious at the time, we managed to get the application moved over. Uh, the next movie is Nightmare on Config Street. So um, uh, one of my other roles, I basically was in charge of uh, deploying and installing and implementing new systems already in, in an existing uh, environment. Um, and I was essentially enabling a number of new servers to be able to speak to the underlying storage. So this is typically what um, fabric storage would look like in a data center. We would have the storage array, which is essentially a fridge sized device filled with disks. Um, and then it will go out to one of, one of two or more fabrics, which essentially are the network that um, the, the data path runs on. So we'd have fabric A and fabric B for um, 
high availability reasons, and then there would be uh, two adapters in the back of every server. And it is that is essentially the connection um, which would allow those servers to access the storage within the storage array. Um, adding new servers uh, is relatively straightforward. Uh, if you've not done this before, but uh, if you've not done this before, typically on a fabric switch, um, you add in a number of rules which are kind of comparable to firewall rules in some regard, in that you will essentially say um, this worldwide number, which is a, a large unique number is, um, of uh, a device. So the worldwide number of the storage array traffic is allowed to go to the worldwide number of the adapter in the new server. So this was kind of the path, uh, the, the steps required in order to add in new servers. Um, normally, we would be existing and updating config. If not, you would create a new config. And then we would add in the, the worldwide number zoning rules, which would essentially allow the array to speak with the new server. Uh, and then we would commit the new and updated configuration. So uh, logged onto the switch as expected. Um, I wanted to update the configuration for Fabric A. So I wanted to create a new rule where I essentially added in um, that this rule allows the, the um, array to speak to the new server, saved that new rule in the config, uh, and then activated that, that config. Uh, however, I didn't realize at the time when I'd activated the config that I'd actually replaced the dash with the underscore. Now, I would have expected this particular fabric switch to give me um, an error saying that this configuration didn't exist. However, this particular brand of fabric switch um, just happily went and applied that configuration. So what did it actually do? It created a brand new configuration um, with that new name that had no rules in it whatsoever and applied it. Um, Obviously, the servers all failed over to their other path to the storage array, and it, they didn't start alarming for at least a few minutes, at which point I was already on the Fabric B switch, uh, almost applying the same configuration. Uh, had those alarms not triggered, um, there's a good chance I would probably have removed the second path, which would pretty much have removed all the storage from all of the servers in that data center, which would have been uh, quite a catastrophe. Um, the next kind of story uh, is the Grand Booting Pest Hotel. Um, I'm hoping um, some of you may have noticed that these are a play on existing movie titles. Um, so this kind of final story, uh, you know, kind of where did where does the story for this actually come from? Well, um, not so long ago, I was uh, working for a customer. Um, they were based in Dubai. Um, the reason for this picture is really because uh, every day I would have to get an Uber out to an area of Dubai um, that was identified only with GPS coordinates. Um, there was a road, but on Google Maps, it's called Unnamed Road, where I would be picked up and then taken to a building to actually do this work. It was a very strange experience. Uh, but the requirements are essentially was to get Kubernetes uh, deployed on physical servers. Uh, their requirements really were, um, they wanted cloud-like behavior, so they wanted server deployments to be automated, they wanted the configuration to be automated, um, they wanted it to be able to scale and things like that. Um, and the main thing really is that the customer just didn't really want to know any of the underlying detail, they really wanted it to be as automated as possible. So I spent a number of weeks with that customer writing uh, a lot of scripts to generate various things to get their metal servers deployed, uh, scripts to automate the deployment of Kubernetes and set things up uh, and make it as well as cloud-like as I possibly could do for them. Um, that kind of got me thinking um, that there probably has to be a better way. So. Um, Six months later, I had spent a number of, I'd spent the last six months kind of coming up with bits of Go code to kind of do uh, various bits of automation. I'd been playing with a lot of different kind of bare metal tech, bare metal deployment technologies. Um, and I'd kind of got a little proof of concepts in a relatively okay working state. Um, and I'd kind of been hacking on it for some time. At which point I could kind of get this thing to automate the deployment of uh, Ubuntu servers, of Linux servers, um, and that all kind of worked as expected. Uh, somebody asked if I would be able to add in the capability for deploying um, additional operating systems. So 
Uh, I was working with a customer in Germany um, at the time. Um, I'd spent all day in their office. I'd come back to the hotel uh, where I'd basically been hacking for a little bit before going out for dinner. Uh, I'd written some additional code, compiled everything, uh, and gone out for dinner um, and leaving this thing running on my laptop without actually realizing. So whilst I was actually out enjoying uh, a Bratwurst in Kassel in Germany, uh, my laptop, which was on the Wi-Fi network, um, had actually bridged onto the same network that some other servers were actually doing DHCP requests. Uh, at one point or another, whilst I was out, uh, a number of machines were all power cycled, um, and they all went onto the network and asked for DHCP details. So instead of them getting their details from the normal server, my laptop actually facilitated their requests. So the server started up, um, asked for any configuration information. My laptop, um, which I'd written a, a, an additional bit of code for, uh, was there to answer before the additional, the original router was. So my laptop started giving these uh, servers deployment information. Um, and these servers then went away and booted from that information. So when I came back, um, I went back to my laptop, woke it back up again and found that a number of servers uh, had registered themselves, um, had taken deployment information uh, and actually booted from some of the stuff that was being advertised from my laptop. Uh, I walked around uh, this hotel. It was a, a, a bespoke hotel in, in, um, in Germany where they, I think they tried to kind of copy some of the stuff that you may see in some of the larger hotels where they do the digital, um, the digital dashboards, which say what meetings are taking place in certain uh, conference rooms, where I noticed there are a number of Linux prompts all sat on those uh, meeting room doors. Uh, it turned out that those, those machines that were in, the, in those doorways or whatever uh, were set to boot from DHCP. They were rebooted every evening to pick up updated uh, display information. Uh, and my deployment uh, tool had basically um, wiped the file systems where possible, tried to install VMware ESX if it's all possible. If not, I'd left them at a running Linux prompt. So by accident, um, as part of my experimentation, I basically kind of left a number of devices in this hotel either wiped or stuck on a, uh, a random prompt. Um, I've not stayed there since, and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, that I accidentally did that, um, but whoops. Uh, uh, so um, that's kind of a step through of the various different areas uh, that I've been involved in, um, some of the mistakes that I've made. Um, a lot of it has been um, tired nights. A lot of it has been experimenting, uh, sometimes in kind of the wrong places. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, the last thing that anybody really should do is kind of worry too much about experimenting. Um, there are always new things that we need to learn. There are always new things um, to play with. Uh, we just need to be careful as and when we're doing these sorts of things. Uh, and finally, um, from all of us at Equinex, uh, if you want to get some free credits, free credits uh, and play with, play with bare metal infrastructure in a safe environment where you can't break it, um, where you can't break it, uh, then there's the promo code Software Circus, which will get you $100 worth of credits that you can use. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Thanks for your talk, Daniel. This was in equal parts fascinating and terrifying. Uh, I think the comments also agree. And uh, we had a comment that people did get the, conf the, the references for the movies. So... Excellent. <laughs> uh, people did get the joke. <laughs> um, I think there was there's a notification for a question, but I can't see it. In the well, let's let's move on. I don't see any any questions here. Thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, everyone who's in, in the audience. Uh, now we have, I think, the pumpkin carving uh, event that you can find the link for in the more tab uh, of the interface. And then we're gonna come back here uh, a bit later uh, to talk about chaos engineering. So thanks a bunch for Daniel again. If this were a live conference, we would be clapping <laughs> and see everyone soon.